Hello YouTube. This is a response to the video Six Ultimate Reasons Not to Be an Atheist. In which case he says that the atheist worldview, and I'm just going to say right here, atheism is not a worldview. It is simply a theism. You do not believe in a god. You don't have to claim there is no god to be an atheist. Atheism simply means you do not believe in a God. Now you might say that's agnosticism, not atheism. Well, agnosticism is actually a form of atheism because in agnosticism you do not actively believe there is a God. Therefore, by the definition of atheism, God, um, agnosticism is a form of atheism. What you're, us what you're probably saying is anti-theism is a worldview which is slightly more correct. Anti-theism is where you're making the claim that there is no God. And you're not even arguing against anti-theism because it is perfectly possible to assert there is no God and still grant all those premises that you made at the same time. For example, you could be an idealist which states that the mind, not matter, is the source of everything. You can still not believe in a God and Say that. The worldview that you're actually arguing against is a worldview called metaphysical naturalism. And actually, in your video, you use atheism, naturalism, and materialism almost interchangeably, which they aren't. So, let's get to it then. Number one, you claim that atheists cannot believe that there is a purpose or meaning to life. I agree. You really can't, at least not in my opinion. So what? You make your own reason for living, but there is no objective reason for living. And I'm actually going to turn it back on you. As Richard Dawkins once wrote, During the minute it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive, others whimpering with fear, waiting to die, and then blah blah blah, he names a bunch of other horrible things that are happening, and then says, the universe has exactly the properties that we should expect if there is, at bottom, no purpose, no good, no evil, nothing but pitiless indifference. So, since all of the evidence seems to lean towards there is no purpose or meaning to life, how do you reconcile that with your God? And if you want to look into the eyes of somebody who's dying of a horrible flesh-eating disease and say, it's all for some purpose, you go right ahead and do that. I'm just going to sit back and watch. Number two, you claim that atheists cannot believe that there is objective morality. Well, there are many atheists that do believe that, or naturalists actually, that do believe that there are objective morals, but I get, again, I agree, there are no objective morals. And as for your question on what obligation do we have to follow them, it's pretty simple. If I don't follow them, the cops are going to arrest me, probably convict me, and probably throw me in jail. I don't want that to happen to me, so I will follow the moral law. And then you could wonder, why would society be moral? Well, it's simply because a society that said that, for example, killing people is moral, would not survive very long because everybody would be killing each other. It, natural selection made us want to obey these moral laws. But if by obligation you mean that some invisible sky daddy is going to strike me down with lightning every time I disobey a moral commandment, or is going to send me to the torture chambers for eternity after I die, then no, there is no obligation. But I don't think that that's the only possible obligation you could have. Number three, you claim that atheists or naturalists cannot believe that there is free will. Well, all the evidence seems to point towards there is no free will. It's simply a construct of our mind. So, since you obviously seem to believe that we do have free will, and God gave us free will, how do you reconcile that with that evidence that there is no free will? And if you ask me for it, I will give it to you, certainly. Also, since you, more likely than not, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
believe that God knows everything, how do you reconcile that with free will? Because if God knows everything, he must also know the future and everything you are going to do. But then you have no real choice in the matter. Think about that. Number four, atheists cannot trust their reason. That's actually the first one that I disagree with you on. I think that we can trust our reason, and there are a couple of reasons for that. The first one is natural selection actually has a good reason for making us reason. Namely, let's say that an Australopithecus person saw a huge chas chasm that she had to get against, and she saw a tree. She could conduct a simulation in her mind of the tree falling over and making a bridge across the chasm. And then she might imagine a fire burning down the tree at that point so that it would fall. And then she would reason that she must make a fire, cut down the tree, and be able to get a, make a bridge to get across the chasm. Now that's probably not the best example because the fire would probably burn down the tree but it shows a nice example of why reason could be useful to uh, people and to people that were naturally selected. Number five, there are no absolute laws of logic. Uh, in particular, you cite the law of, of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. Those laws are not as absolute as you think they are. There have been logical calculuses, or calculi, I guess you would say, that actually change those. For example, the law of the excluded middle is not a premise in a logical calculus called fuzzy logic, which states that the truth value doesn't have to be true or false, but it can be anything between true or false. It's a degree of truth. For and that would be useful, for example, if I say it's cold versus it's very cold, my definition of cold and very cold are probably different from yours. As for, for example, the law of non-contradiction, well, as it turns out, there is a, va value, a logic with four values, true, false, neither true nor false, and both true and false. Obviously, in order for something to be both true and false, you have to throw out the law of non-contradiction. And you can find scores of logical calculi that do not include one or more of these so-called absolute laws. And again, I put the question to you. Since you think that God gave us these laws of logic intending them to be absolute, why can we disregard them so easily and form perfectly consistent laws of um, logical calculi that do not use these laws? Number eight, we cannot believe that there is uh, any absolute truth. If we assume that the default which was that truth is not objective or absolute, which you're making an assertion there without any kind of real justification. And that's what I'm going to say until you give me a good reason for believing it. But even if we assumed that that were the default position of truth, how would the existence of God change that at all? In order for that to happen, God would need to be able to be outside of any concept of truth value. And in order, in order for that to be the case, then it would, if God really were outside of truth and false, then God, you could say that God doesn't exist even though he does exist. Truth value has no meaning to him. Well, that's all six of your uh, reasons, and I hope to hear back from you. Thank you, and see you all later.